Um, we're just going to jump in. This is our normal monthly office hour. We've repurposed this office hour to focus on the performance report. We do have a lot of information for you today, so we're going to walk through the information and then we'll have a, a moment for questions and answers at the end. Please know that our office hours are recorded and housed on our website for future use. So if you want to return or if you have a colleague who might be interested in the content but unable to attend, um, they have an opportunity to jump in and view the content as well. So as I said, we have a few teammates who will be joining us shortly as they're trying to troubleshoot some technology issues. My name is Shelley Shassi Jandro. I am the director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs. We also have Monique Sullivan, who is the ARP coordinator. And Karen Kuziak, who I think is having difficulties with her audio. She is the CARES and CARISA coordinator. And I'm Kevin Harrington. I'm the GEAR and EANS coordinator. I am Maisha Asha. I am fiscal coordinator. I'm Robert Palmer, and I'm the management analyst. So a couple highlights. So we received uh, information from the U.S. Department of Education yesterday that informed us that they are delaying the report that we are required to submit to them from the beginning of February to the beginning of May. As you know, we use the information that we collect in your performance report to be able to tell your story to the U.S. Department of Education. So we've been awarded some additional time, so we'd also like to award you some additional time to complete the performance report. So the original ESEA, um, excuse me, my apologies, the original ESER performance report was due on January 21st. We have extended that due date. The new due date is Friday, March 25th, 2020. So that is some new information that we will be also sharing with all of our applicant coordinators and our superintendents by close of business today so that they have that information. We know some folks joined us on Monday during our walk-in performance report office hours. And this is brand new information, hot off the press. So we hope that puts a smile on everyone's face and allows them to engage in this work with a longer timeline. With that said, there was also some other news within that information that was sent to us. And when we designed the performance report, the information that we had was on the grid to the left of your screen. And it was really this timeline of October 1st, 2020, through September 30th of 2021, which we had indicated to you folks would be the reporting period of the performance report. Again, the news that came to us yesterday from the US Department of Education is that they would like our annual reports to be completed based on the state fiscal year. So as you folks are familiar with, our state fiscal year runs July 1st of one year through June 30th of the next year. That's also how our SAUs run their fiscal finances as well. So we know that this is going to create some confusion, but our team is here to support and to clarify. This information will also be included in the email that we send by close of business today, because this will restructure the projects that you're reporting on in the performance report as well as some other fiscal items. The other thing to note here is the table on the right is the information we received yesterday from the US Department of Education. And ESER 1 will have a reporting period of October 1st, 2020 through the end of the state fiscal year of 2021, which we all know is June 30th, 2021. And I know on Monday we had a question in our walk-in office hours related to some time last summer that may not be reported. And essentially, ESERF 1 has already been reported last summer. We reported the information that we had on hand. And now we're engaging with the U.S. Department of Education for the first time for our first annual report for CARISA ESER 2 
and for ARP, ESER 3. So you'll see on that chart on the right that that indicates the reporting period of the state fiscal year. So for ESER 2 and ESER 3, you will be reporting July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. And we make that very clear on the very next slide. So I'm gonna put those dates up. What our team tried to do is we tried to highlight any changes on this information in red based on our new information that we received from the US Department of Education that we received yesterday. I know we have some questions in the chat box. We will most definitely address those. There's an area down below um, in our PowerPoint that relates directly to fiscal, and we will talk a little bit more and engage with the question that we have in the chat box. So okay. we know that the performance report um, will create some work for school districts, whether that is to run financials or to confirm that invoices have been submitted, as well as re-engage in conversations about the projects that have been established in each funding source. So we wanted to provide you with some supports. One of the supports is a blank copy of the performance report, and you can access that from our website. So essentially what happens is we've created every section of the performance report on this blank Word document and it's downloadable. So you can actually use that item and that tool to divide and conquer and indicate you know, roles and responsibilities for section five, uh, excuse me, section four positions and staffing might be best suited to have person X work on this section. So collectively, it's a team effort to complete the performance report. In addition, if your business managers are new or fairly new to this work, we also have instructions about how to complete and submit an invoice for reimbursement. And that's available on our 4PCAMain.org website. Scroll all the way down to the bottom once you've logged, once you've um, hit the landing page and you'll have this, this item available to you. Our team is also available for technical assistance upon request, so one-on-one. -on -one. If you have questions or if you want to engage in deeper conversation, please either email any one of our teammates or myself directly, and we will work on making sure that we set some time aside to engage in a virtual meeting with you folks so that we can walk through any questions that you may have and or troubleshoot any challenges that you may be having. In addition, um, one item that's in development currently is an FAQ. So we had our first walk-in office hour for the performance report on Monday, and we had some questions that were posed to us. We've also been exchanging emails with SAUs in regards to questions, and we wanna create one document. So all of those questions live in that one document. So if you happen to have a question, you may visit that FAQ, see that other, other individuals had the similar question and see the response in live time. We hope to have that on our website by close of next week. That will be an evolving document as questions come in, we will update accordingly. So we, we encourage you to visit it frequently. And as soon as we have a direct link for that, we will share the FAQs with you folks. In addition, we've created walk-in office hours. And what those walk-in office hours are designed to do is to have, a, have our team available for one hour on Monday or Wednesday of every week between now and the new due date of March 25th, 2020 for the performance report. So this is, again, a change because our office hours were, our walk-in office hours were going to be held Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for the next four weeks. But with this extended timeline and the delay in the performance report due date, we wanted to provide you with this information. You are not required to um, create an appointment. It is essentially a walk-in. If we were in an office setting, we would have the same component of an open door policy. So between the hours of 11 and 12 on those Mondays listed, and between the hours of one and two on those Wednesday listed, our team will be on Zoom, available for any questions that you may have. I, 
Shelley, I can um, I can hear fine. Uh, there are statutory uh, requirements, reporting requirements. You may be wondering uh, why do you have to do this? Well, we are required, and the, the citations are there. We are required as a state to report how th these funds have been used. So there's financial reporting and monitoring. And also uh, the same regulations give us the authority to ask subgrantees or local school districts to also submit reports to us in a manner that allows us to complete the report that we need to send to the US Department of Education about how the funds have been used. And, uh, well, yes, I think the next slide will drive this next point. Uh, there are a number of purposes for the reporting and we have them uh, linked here in a list. Uh, it's a good check on what's been invoiced and what balance is remaining. Uh, and you know, we're asked this periodically by all kinds of folks. Um, in state government and from the public. Uh, it's also required through the cost principles. Um, we wanna make sure it's a good check on whether or not the expenses and the reimbursement align with the different projects and they are allowable uses, skipping down to another one. Um, we also, it's another check on whether or not the funds are being used according to the goals of the acts that were passed. And as I said, as I was alluding to, legislators, community members, journalists, uh, and other stakeholder groups are asking about how this money is, is used. And I was on a reading a Twitter uh, feed last night where people were discussing this, not even in our state, but they were discussing how are these funds being used? Um, and so, so this is very much uh, apparent. And uh, indeed, already our, our own state legislators several times have asked how SAUs are using the money, particularly for uh, school buildings and ventilation and HVAC equipment. Uh, so the performance reports relate to, okay, here are some questions that have come up. Here are two questions. The performance reports that we're asking you to do at this point are for the ESER programs only. So for the CARES, CARISA, and ARP, Elementary and Secondary Education Emergency Relief or ESER programs. So we're not asking in this report anything about the CRF pro uh, program that um, you had access to because that program was financed by the US Treasury and not the Department of Education. We've also had a question about whether or not there would be an extension for the use of these funds. And uh, no, the tidings period has already been um, allocated nationwide. We didn't have to ask for it. So that's already been applied to these funds. And we have not heard any inkling, any discussion, any rumors about the funds being extended beyond the dates that you can see right there in the chart. I can go ahead and do this one, Shelly. Um, before starting, we just wanted to make sure that everyone um, had everything in, in, in place before they started because it can be kind of frustrating if you don't know all the pieces or have all the people um, at the table that need to be there. So before you start, you really want to review your projects, your budgets and expenses um, for CARES ESSER 1, CRISA ESSER 2, and ARP ESSER 3. Go back to your applications and review those. Um, it's really essential that you work with your business manager to align your expenses and reimbursements with your project descriptions and budgets. Um, all activities occurring between the reporting periods must be invoiced before completing this performance report. And those um, reporting dates are gonna be different as you can see for each of the um, ESSERs. So for, we, you know, we'll say this multiple times today because it has been of a change. So um, CARES, um, I'm sorry, CARES ESSER 1. So you're gonna to have to make sure that you have all of your um, invoices submitted and hopefully processed for any activities uh, between October 1st of 2020 and June 30th of 2021. So any activity that you um, were going to use uh, ESSER 1 for needs to be submitted before you do this performance report. The same is for CARES ESSER 2. 
So if you have any activity that you're planning on pay or have paid for um, uh, between July 1st of 2020 and June 30th of 2021, you wanna get those invoices in before you complete this performance report. And that is the same for ARP S3. You really wanna make sure that you have everyone, everyone has access, make sure everyone has access to the information needed to complete the performance report. As many of you know, I used to be a principal and when reports would come out, it'd get divvied up. And, but it could be frustrating on the other end if, if someone has to do part of a report, but they don't even know what that report is or where to access that information. So we really wanna be here to support you in that, but also um, encourage you to make sure that everyone who's taking part in this performance report has the information they need to complete the report or maybe their section of the report. And then review the broad reporting categories to determine the best method to gather the information needed to complete the, um, the performance report. And that's why we provided a blank copy so you can kind of look at it and see what information you're going to need. And then you can go out and go and, and gather that information to, re, to, um, to complete the performance report. Shelly, there are some questions in the chat. I don't know if we wanna wait for those or, um, and can, or continue on. If your question relates to the items directly on the screen, I would encourage you to either put it in the chat box and or unmute yourself to ask verbally. We are trying, our team is monitoring the chat box and trying to respond to the questions directly in the chat box as well. I have a, a, a question with regard separate from the one that I put in the chat. So um, the performance report, uh, if I'm looking at this screen, um, actually, no, I think I just answered my own question. So um, I'm gonna bow out. Uh, I, I, I did put one in the chat, apparently um, um, that would mean that we would have to redo everything that we've done so far, um, including all of the data and narratives that we've put in um, uh, to make it accurate for the March deadline. So the financials is most definitely an area that likely will need to be rerun if you've already ran them at this point. However, it is aligned to the fiscal year. So we're hoping that through you know, an audit of last summer. Most of your invoices have been submitted through June 30th of 2021. We know that some, some districts may have been use, utilizing some of this downtime to potentially focus on what the projects were at hand and may not have been invoicing specifically through September of 30, 2021. So hopefully all of your invoices have been submitted for June, up to June 30th, 2021. We do hope that that will streamline the process for you folks. It also aligns directly with the US Department of Education's annual report. And one item that I just wanna highlight to, just to clarify, the dates for the three funding packages are different because at this point, the Maine Department of Education has not been required to report to the U.S. Department of Education or CRISA ESERF 2 or ARP ESERF 3, which is why they've indicated that additional state fiscal year, which starts in our case on July 1st of 2020. We do anticipate that many of you folks have not engaged in work during that time frame for ARP ESERF 3. So if we're looking for any silver linings, the couple of them in my perspective is related to the fact that the timeline for ARP very likely um, indicates very little activity in that component. And in addition, aligns much more with our fiscal year as well as an SAU fiscal year. So we do hope that it does not create an, a whole abundance of work, but we do understand that this change at this time is potentially confusing and will require some additional work. And we apologize for that. However, we wanna be sure that we are aligning to the request of the US Department of Education and not duplicating any information that is sent to them to ill represent the stories that you folks are engaging in. I have more of a technical question, if that's okay. 
So I have tried several times to complete um, the performance report. And every time when I'm in the financial, it'll let me make changes to the first project and any other project after that, it won't save the numbers. I'll put them in there and it will show that they're there. But as soon as I hit save, they go to zero. And I've tried it on different computers. I've tried it on different platforms. And it's weird that project one will save the data. And even if I go on to say ESER 2, it'll let me fill in project one and it will save it. But as soon as I go to project two and hit save, the numbers all go to zero again. And I'm just not sure who to contact to, to figure out what's going on with that. So Kelly, if you don't mind sending myself an email, that would be great. I'll put my email in the chat box here momentarily. We will work with our software developers to be sure that it is not a program error. One thing okay. that I will say is when you're dealing with um, the financial components, be sure that you are not including any commas or dollar signs. Yeah, okay, good. And it looks like I may not be the only one, so. Thank you, I will Perfect. send you that message. Thank you. I wanted to ask a question, Shelly, about the, hi, this is Dawn. <laughs> How are you? Um, the last page that we were just looking at. So I know you just mentioned this, but um, ARP, we didn't even get funds until, like the application wasn't even due until September. So we didn't even have funds until after that. So like, we're in the clear, that's going to be all zero, right? I know you can go backwards, but we wouldn't have been able to invoice before we actually had money, right? So Shelly, I can answer that one if you want. Okay. Um, uh, so yes, Don, we thought about that, but remember your period of liability goes all the way back to March 13th of 2020. So it is possible that you might have had activities that you were planning on using ARP fund um, funding for. Okay. So, um, so technically, you know, you could go back and say, hey, we want to do, we want to pay for PPE um, for May of 2021 using our ARP. So technically you could have some invoices that um, would fall within that reporting period for ARP. Um, so some districts haven't done that, but some districts have. So it really depends on the district. So. Okay. And oh, I, just an additional note is remember that it is the expense in the period of its reflection, not when it was submitted. So you may have submitted a expense report or an invoice in October of 2021, but it truly was for the month of June. You want to be sure that you capture those expenses in this performance report, even though the invoice may have only been submitted a few months later. Okay, that makes sense to me. Uh, that, I guess that's my silver lining. Thank you. So we're just going to jump right into the sort of the performance report itself. So you folks have been to the GEM portal many, many times, whether that is for applications for the federal emergency relief programs and or other programs. One note that I would like to make is we as a federal emergency relief program office will continue to maintain our status on GEMS. I know other programs within the department have transitioned to grants for Maine. Grants for me, my apologies, but we will remain on GEMS through the longevity of all of these funds, whether that's the application that you need to revisit and revise or the performance report. All that information will remain on GEMS. So we're just gonna jump into a couple of the setup pages and the cover sheet as well. So you'll see that there's five different sections within the performance report. And essentially, if you work your way through top to bottom, the, the numbers will talk to each other, but also the reports will correlate if there's any correlation on the back end within the co coding. So we wanna be sure that you're thinking through this performance report 
We also want to be sure that you utilize the blank copy because at times it's difficult to see all the questions in one sitting in GEMS until it's completed and you can download it as a PDF. So be sure when you are working through the performance report that when you do the setup page that the information is accurate. That includes the email for the superintendent and the name of the individual responsible because that information populates the cover sheet. So when you go to the end of the performance report and you hit and you're ready to submit it and have it reviewed by the superintendent, if that email is incorrect in the page setup, that superintendent will not receive the information to be able to certify the performance report. Shelly, I can do part two. Um, so part two is the COVID-19 impact. So with all of these uh, funding sources, um, there does need to be a relation back to COVID and how um, you know our, our catchphrase is prepare for, prevent, or respond to COVID. So everything is viewed through that lens. So in this section of part two, you're gonna indicate how the SAU identified students that were most impacted by COVID-19 um, and you're also going to verify the six month review of your plan for safe return in person instruction. And you're also going to make sure that it's provided publicly um, on your website. Um, and then you're also going to provide the URL of the publicly available use of funds plan. Um, now, um, it's important to keep in mind that along with that six month review requirement for the plan for safe return in person instruction, both plans, the use of funds plan and the safe, um, safe return instruction, both of those plans need to be on your website, your, your, um, your district website, publicly available to anyone um, until at this point, unless things change um, to the period of allowability for this, for all the, for the grants until 930 of 2024. Um, so keep that in mind. And I think some of you guys have already realized that the U.S. Department of Education is constantly checking those URLs. Um, I mean, we've all they'll send us an email back and say, "Hey, some of these email, some of these URLs don't work," and so we have to scramble and get them to work. So I know that sometimes they get like when you have them listed on your website and they just get scrolled down to the bottom. You want to make sure that you get you keep getting those up at the top of your website and they're up to date. You want, I can do this one too, Shelly. Part three, use of funding. Um, this is, there's several parts to this one. I tried to divide it up a little bit um, easier for you to, to see, um, but you have the connectivity, which is part 3A. And there's that's where you're going to specify how your CARES, CRISA and ARP, um, ESSER funds um, were used to provide connectivity to students and teachers. Now I have a little asterisk down at the bottom, and this is because we know you guys have a thousand things to do. And at that point, we thought we didn't have as much time. So we also tried to make it a little easier to complete. But many of the responses that we have in this report are, are already populated um, responses. They're either radial buttons or they're check boxes. And we're really encouraging you guys to use those responses. Um, I mean, unless you need to use the other, uh, this will help with you completing the report, but it will also help with us reviewing the reports. And also when we have to report that information back to the US Department of Education. Um, the, there is the third part, third, uh, part 3B, is to remote learning. Again, you're gonna specify how your um, SAU is using ESSER funds, both CARES, CRSA, and ARP, um, how they were used to support remote learning. And then the last two parts are on evidence-based evidence interventions, your part 3C and your part 3D. And this is where you're gonna talk about um, the learning recovery and acceleration programming that you provided to specific student groups. And you're going to actually identify which groups were targeted with or provided the, the special programming, the evidence-based intervention. You're just gonna check boxes. Um, and then also there's a section in there about school health related exp expenditures, and you'll have um, some pieces of that to fill out as well. I think, um, and Don asked, will this require, there's no CRF one or two in this. 
This is only for your ESSER or ESER funds, um, which are under CARES, CARISA, and ARP. CRF one and two um, is under a different piece of the legislation and a different, um, a, a different department is going to be overseeing that. We think, we don't know, that may change. And in addition, as Monique mentioned, that those funds, CRF1, CRF2, and CRF reallocated, was distributed to the main department of it through the state, through the Department of Administrative and Financial Services to support youth schools through the U.S. Treasury. And at this time, we don't have any information about what may be included in a performance report or what type of questions. So we would hate to collect information that we essentially would not use. So we're just waiting to hear a little bit more from the entities to be able to clearly indicate what we need to be able to tell that story to, to the US Treasury at that time. I have a question. This is Mary Boyle. I have a question about um, a couple of items in the connectivity page, if I could ask those now. So one of them relates to the number of students that we are reporting. It says, um, did the district use Easter funding? And then among the students enrolled on October 1st, how many students had district provided devices funded by the above Easter funds? But then the next question breaks it down by ethnicity and by student group. And then it also bundles in gear funds. So am I to assume that the student counts in the bottom section won't add up to the student count in the top section. Yes, Mary, that's accurate. Okay. There will, will not be a one-to-one -one correlation. And essentially we created it in that fashion because those pots of money, the gear connectivity money and the ESER money all sort of blended together to support the urgent need of getting devices into kiddos' hands. So we don't expect any district to be able to say, Johnny got a device and that device was paid for by year. Um, Jane got a device and that device was paid for by ESER. And Jane happens to be a student who is an English language learner of, or uh, you know, a child of poverty. So we tried to kind of simplify that to the best of our ability, knowing that essentially districts had funds that came in and supported that work. Thank you. I have one other question, and maybe this is my ignorance on this, but how do you folks see the question on connectivity as different from having a device and different from having home internet? Would that be related to platforms that you're using or software that you're using? So as you know, on the onset of the pandemic, it was very evident that our potentially we were disproportionately um, Um, excuse me, we were disproportionately unavailable to participate in education based on home financial status. So what we tried to do was collectively, we heard the need that connectivity and a device to be able to do the work was critical. However, if you had a device, but you didn't have reliable home internet service, or you're, you know, you were not in a, in a situation where you could access the internet. We, we had the opportunity to support districts and families in both of those entities. So that's why we see them as very distinct. Some families may not have needed a device because the schools were already providing them, whether that be through their MLTI programs or through other programs, but may have needed that connectivity to actually make that device usable in their home situation. Okay, so I guess my question is, so there's a question related to devices and a question related to home internet or, and then there's also a question related to connectivity. So I guess I'm still unclear about what the connectivity part of it is or is it just kind of redundant and then the next one just gets to what type of home internet did you need? So I, I will have to take that back to our team, but right now I, I think at this point, it really, for me, is about 
that internet and that device, but let, let us take that back to our team okay, and have thanks. a deeper conversation so that we can actually pull up the performance report and see the questions. Thank you. Monique, do you want to continue while I monitor the chat box if you don't yeah, mind? I can, I can do that. So part four, positions and staffing. Um, and we have had a couple of questions about this. So I think we have another slide after this that will help um, hopefully clarify it a little bit. Um, so in part one, you're going to report, you're going to report your FTE positions um, in 2018, 19, 20, and 21 for certain identified positions. Um, and then you're, and in part two, you're going to report the number of positions that the SAU intended to hire and did hire. And then part three, you're going to report on the number of specific positions um, that the list is provided in the, in the report um, that you retained with CARES, CRISA, and ARP funds. Now, part three is a little confusing because you're thinking, what's the difference between intended to hire and did hire versus retained? And what we're trying to figure out here, trying to uh, separate or denote is that some districts, um, the pandemic, the pandemic caused them to have a sh budget shortfall, or they didn't have as um, they didn't have as much funds, so they used their um, ESSER funding to maintain or retain their teachers at their current level, so they didn't have to um, have any layoffs. So they used that to keep those teachers uh, or those staff members employed, and that's where that. Um, retention as of that retaining um, with CARES, CRISA, and ARP funds. Now, some of these questions are a little nuanced, so it's really important that you kind of read each question um, because it is asking for different information. And I think that's where the next slide um, comes into play. So we have a lot of questions and we're hoping to put these in our FAQs, our FAQ document, um, and be able to answer them a little bit um, more succinctly. But so in one chart, you are asked to talk about the role. And I always think about this almost like an absolute value. So like, we don't wanna know special ed teachers. We don't wanna know like title one teachers. We don't, we just wanna know teacher as an absolute, like how many teachers? Um, and we have had some other questions about like, where do we put some of our, um, like, our, our, um, like our nurse or something like that. So hopefully we can get those ironed out as we're working through this. And then the next chart is more about the responsibility. Like what are the, what are those staff members doing? And they're asking, we're asking for two different types of information. Um, and the counts may be different in question one and question two. Um, and that's okay because you may have, you know, it's not gonna necessarily work out. Um, there's not going to be, there may not be a one-to-one -one correspondence um, between um, part four, um, part four and part one. So there's an, just an example here, um, Shelly, I don't know if you want to go back, that, um, you know, a, a person that was hired to be an attendance officer um, may actually be an administrator, maybe an ad tech, or maybe clerical support. So the title they have may not actually be the, um, the absolute value of what their position is. So they could be an administrator, but they also are an attendant. They're doing the attendance work. I have some small detail to add. We also had a question about pool testers and pool testers would go with nurses and contact tracers. And I, and on a positive note, I think getting the extra time has also helped us try to work out where you guys can put your staffing to, to fit with the chart and to fit with the requirements that the Department of Education is asking, the U.S. Department of Education is asking for. So I guess we're asking for a little bit of, um, Grace, as we figure out how we can best support you and get your staff um, best accounted for and put it in the right category so that it accurate, accurately reflects um, your, um, your staffing. So there may be a little bit of, of touch as we put it in the FAQs and adjust um, and work with you to put them in the right categories or the most appropriate categories would be a better way to say that. So I just wanted to clarify a couple things. There was a few questions that in regards to logistics of the software, I'm going to check on part three evidence-based question number 15, that's related to school health services. I'll confirm that no is an allowable 
choice and that it's not automatically reverting back to yes. I will also check on the decimals for FTEs because that is important because we want to be sure that it's an accurate reflection of you folks of the bodies within and the time that you folks have devoted. So a couple, and then the last question is in regards to bus drivers, custodians, and maintenance workers. So essentially what the US Department of Education has asked our SEAs to do is to indicate if there indeed was an additional need to have more human capital. And what did that human capital look like? Or what were the roles and responsibilities of that additional human capital that was required to combat the pandemic that we were in? So if you're thinking about like bus drivers, custodians and maintenance workers, that is essentially staff pro providing support services that is non-clerical. So when you go through your NEO reports and you're looking at those, those roles, that is how you may want to think about it. So how do I capture everyone that we had at this time frame during this year? Because as you know, on this performance report, it goes, it starts in 2018 and goes all the way up to our current school year. And our anticipation based on the question from the US Department of Education is to show that there was a greater need for whether that be educational supports or cleaning supports or contact pool tracers. Um, so thinking about how you might be able to capture everyone within these roles within your school to be able to really communicate the additional need that very likely presented itself during this pandemic. And then you'll see on another part where it really talks about what was your intention in, in this section of physicians and staff? What was your intention and what were you actually able to hire for staff? Because we know that the market is very challenging at this point for a whole array of reasons. And potentially you had a desire to have additional bus drivers, but we're not able to actually hire them. So though, that's kind of where this section is hopefully telling that narrative. Where there was a need, we were, we were committed to that need, However, we had some challenges in regards to locating those individuals. Shall I continue? And I also just wanted to say that we do appreciate all the feedback you're giving us on the, um, the performance report, because when I said this earlier on Monday, when we do it and we review it, you know, as many times as we think, and then when you guys are actually putting it, putting actually using it. You're finding things that we need to correct. So thank you for the feedback. We do appreciate it, and we will work hard to to work out any of those um, issues. So um, part five is where you're going to list your expenditures for each of the funding: CARES SR1, CARISA SR2, and ARP SR3. And this is where it's really important that your invoicing is up to date based on um, your activities during that during each of the reporting periods, and if you had if you're planning on using um, that particular funding source. So again, if you're planning on using if you use CARES um, for activities between 10 1 20 and 6 30 of 21, then you need to make sure when you report out on that in your performance report that your invoicing on the reimbursement side matches that um, and aligns to that. And that's the same for CRISA expenditures, which is 7120 to 63021 and ARP expenditures as well. Um, and then again, um, some of you are familiar with this with other federal reporting. So you may have expended all this, but your invoicing doesn't match it. Um, so you want to make sure your invoicing aligns with what your performance report, uh, what you're reporting in, on your performance report. Shelly, do you want to do this slide? Sure. sure. So there is one section of the performance report that is related to project expenditures. What we wanted to highlight is that a lot of this information is being pulled directly from your application. So the yellow section for any K-1 
category or any project that you had within your application, whether that be CARES ESERF 1, CARISA ESERF 2, or ARP ESERF 3, that yellow line is the budget that you indicated in the application. The line within blue is those expenses that you have invoiced during the reporting period, whether that be October through June or July through June, depending on the funding source that it came from. And then the teal area where the activities description is included, that is a pull from your application as well to highlight some of the things that were supported with these funds. And then the next item in the blue box is really the area in which you say, you know, we were able to do X, Y, and Z. And this is one of the sections that has a little bit more of an area for narrative. We want this to be as concise as possible so that when we're reporting this information back to the US Department of Education, we can tell your story. So you may have indicated that you wanted to um, purchase X number of computers and hire a tech specialist. You may have only been able to participate in the activities of buying, buying the devices and not necessarily engage in hiring a new person. So in that activities conducted box, you would say just that purchased uh, technology for students. And then we can um, communicate that narrative to the US Department of Education. So you wanna be sure that you work with your business managers to be sure that all of your invoices are up through June 30th of 2020, regardless of the funding source that it came from. And because it's connected to your, my apologies, I just saw a question right in the chat box. Because it's connected to your application, if you modify your application, that will automatically talk to the performance report. So many of you guys have your own way of keeping track of your expenses. Um, and I had mentioned this earlier a few, or a few months ago about you have so many different funding sources and you, now we have different reporting, our billing periods or reporting periods. So, um, you know, I was thinking that it might be helpful. Um, I just did a quick, simple expen you know, uh, Excel expenditure, lining up my CARES, my CRISA and my ARP ESSER funds and just was thinking like, what would be some potentials that could cross over all three? Uh, maybe some would only cross over a couple. I'm um, like, I was thinking of several programming. Um, you know, you may have paid your teachers out of um, summer programming out of CARES, but then maybe you used Carissa to do some pre-planning, which would be covered in that time frame. Um, so like 7-1 to 20, uh, 7-1-20. Uh, 2020 to 8:30, 20 was when you funded your um, FY20 summer school. Um, but then you wanted to have your teachers do some uh, planning for your FY21 summer school. So maybe you had they started prepping in May and June for your summer school for FY21. So that would have covered um, that could be in both um, SR1 CARES or CARES SR1 and Carissa SR2. So I just tried to come up with some examples. Um, some things that I know districts are doing. So they're kind of, I kind of made them up, but I didn't really, cause these are actually things that are projects that schools are actually doing. Um, and they may be spanning over um, several funding sources within that reporting period, within all the two different reporting periods. If this is confusing, don't use it. It was just trying to be helpful to try to map it out a little bit. And then the last piece um, of the performance report is your maintenance of equity. And we uh, did do uh, an office hours on 12 21 on outlining how to calculate your maintenance of equity, uh, which is available on our, um, on our website. And um, once you, you know, I also created, I'll put a link in here as well. If you have questions about maintenance of equity, um, you can definitely reach out to any one of us um, and ask those questions or go to the, the resources that we have on that webpage. And then submission. I know there's always a lot of, um, 
sometimes there can be some troubleshooting that has to happen with submissions. So um, it's really important that you're on your data entry side when you first start and that there should be check marks next to every section and that includes the general directions and your setup page. So when you scan through, you see check marks next to everything. Um, although I see one check mark that's not there, but it's still working. Um, and then down at the bottom, you should have an extra blue message that says no additional information is needed um, or required to be able to submit. So this is your, when you get that second blue message that says you're ready to submit. So then you're gonna go to the submissions page, uh, which is the sec right next to, um, to it on the data entry side up at the top on that blue bar and then a submissions page, and then you'll have a place to enter your password. Now, I know that there's several um, superintendents that are doing both the, you know, they're doing the, they're actually entering this information. So I always just tell them, this is not the information that you're using to certify the report. This is your coordinator password. This is what you're using to actually log into the system and complete the application or complete the performance report. Um, and then you should have, and I don't have it on this one, but you should, once you submit, you should have a little red message up at the top that says that it has been sent to the Department of, Main Department of Education and that it's, it's all set. So if you think you've submitted, but you haven't seen this page and you haven't done, you haven't seen the little box to submit, um, then you haven't submitted. Um, and if you don't see it on the submission side, go back to your data entry side and see if you have those check marks. Now we do have some funky issues that happen. So if you know everything's checked, just send you know send um, me an email or, or Karen or one of us, and we can try to troubleshoot on our end. If not, we will definitely send um, some uh, a request for help from our Gems programmer. And at this time, I'm just going to stop sharing the screen, and we can start with any question and answers. I have to scoot off to another engagement that started at 930, um, but my team will remain to answer any of your questions and we will follow up with any questions that we, we may not have been able to respond to today. So I know that uh, Don just asked who the contact people are. So it's, so like the frontline people would be Karen and, and myself and then Shelly. Um, Karen and I are pretty much doing a lot of the ARP. If it's a specific financial question, like um, more on the invoicing side, then you wanna reach out to Maisha or Rob. Um, and they're more of the, they're the ones that are doing the actual invoicing side. We're more on the programmatic side, but if it's a question like, hey, this invoice isn't, it's funky, it's not working, then you wanna reach out to Maisha um, or, or, or Rob. But if it's more of a programming issue, you, something's not working in the, in the, in the performance report or act, the actual application, then reach out to, um, to Karen or I, and we can try to help troubleshoot for you on that. Thank you. And Shelly's always there, but as you guys know, she's the director and she has a 5,000 things. So not that she won't get back to you, but you might get a quicker response from, from Karen or I. And uh, one of the slides that I would look at is just simply to give you the resources if you have anything you'd like to uh, say to us or um, touch base now or later on, we'll certainly answer all of those for you. Uh, where where Shelly was running the slide, she clicked off of it, so I'm not actually seeing the last slide. So I, I may just start singing. <laughs> Kevin, you're wanting the uh, contact information slide or are you wanting the resource slide? Uh, well, yeah, I think the contact was probably the last one. There were, again, there were some links, but then there were also uh, the information to catch up with us. Okay, there we go, yeah. You're Rob. Great. Thanks, Rob, I was gonna do it, but you did it for me. Shelly had me uh, have them up just in case she had to leave earlier, so. So, uh, are there any other questions or concerns that we might be able to address now? I guess the only comment or concern that I would mention in, and I know it's not applicable to everyone, Kevin, uh, yep. however, um, um, I, I would say just be mindful that um, um, if there are any changes to the deadline and we were to be pushing that forward beyond March for some reason, that um, um, it does take some districts uh, a lot to coordinate 
um, the many parts of this uh, performance report. Um, and um, when a change is made and we're less than two weeks from a deadline um, where it would completely change all of the data that we've already put into the performance report, it does cause a little bit of a headache to, to then go back and ask those people to redo their work. So yeah. um, I would just be mindful of that. Definitely. I know, I know when the, if you will, the, the good news came in, there's always that other side, like folks are already you know, preparing for the date that was there and it's, and it's going to change some things. So we, we appreciate that. Was there any other questions or comments? Anything else in the chat so you folks maybe might see? Is, maybe this is jumping the gun, but do you have any sense that this will be the annual time frame for the reporting? We are anticipating based on the chart that we uh, did at the beginning of the presentation that I think Shelly mentioned that the change in the reporting dates was actually based on public comment uh, that the whole country came in and said, you have to make it more aligned with what our states and our um, LEAs are actually doing. So at this point, we don't anticipate any changes, but as you guys know, for the last two years, um, things are changing. Uh, they, they change uh, pretty quickly or it's more of a dynamic situation. So uh, we don't so anticipate them changing the, changing the reporting dates uh, because they're doing this to help align with SEA reporting dates. But, so in the future, we would yeah. still have until March, the middle of March to report on something that ended in, in June of the last fiscal year? Do you anticipate that or do you anticipate it being bumped up earlier? I, boy. That's a good question, Eric. They, they've given us that no you don't know. Okay, that, I, yes. My guess would be that this was a one-time thing and that next year they would be saying, you should know that you have to do yep. this. So it will be earlier. I, but yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, and I apologize. I was thinking you thought about the reporting dates, but it, the actual day that we, the depart, the SEA has to report out to the federal, um, to the feds. Right now it's, it's, you know, they changed the date from February to May, but now they could change it again, you know, next year in six months, we don't know. So we're doing, you know, we're working with what we have, the information that we have, but thank you. I mean, we really do appreciate your feedback um, and we really want to be here and support all of you. So definitely give us your feedback and we'll take it away and take it with us and try to adjust and adapt to what you guys need. Hey, Monique, I had a quick question. Um, I, would, I would like, well, it's actually, I just would like to better understand on part um, six, the maintenance of equity, um, number four um, asks or describes the maintenance of equity waiver, and it gives a few situations where that might be acceptable. Um, would you mind explaining each of those bullets just a, a little bit in more detail than what they have, or I'm happy to circle back around with you on that at a different time if that's better. You're muted. Sorry, is it question six? Is that what you said? Yes. Um, question four. Question four really gives the, there's four bullets underneath question four. Um, the SAU has requested a maintenance of equity requirement waiver from the US because of maybe one of these exceptional or uncontrollable circumstances. Do you so, expect that anybody in Maine would meet any of those? And maybe just a better description would help me make sure I eliminate the option and complete. Dominique, so we're answering, uh what, part six, number four? Just right. So part, folks know. Yeah, part six, number four. Thank you. So this is an area that we're not going to make that determination. This is where the, um, the you know, the U.S. Department of Education will make that. So these were, these, what's listed in those bullets, the unpredictable change, a precipitous decline, one-time exemption, those are examples that were given to us by the U.S. Department of Education. So Unless Karen, you want to respond, I'm not sure. Like, if 
like, I don't know of any at this point, we haven't received any, um, um, you know, exemptions. Uh, so I don't really know, Jenny, how that, you know, we can go back and talk about that with our team. It is a little confusing because it's on our application, but we're not in control of it. So even though it's, we have to report out on our application and we're doing it more for maintenance of equity so we can help with our reporting because we have to report out on maintenance of equity as well. This is kind of just a way to help us um, gather that information, but actually being a awarded it, we, we don't have that information at this time. Unless Karen, do you know of any? No, I mean, I'm happy to talk through or any of us could talk through with you, Jenny, what your situation yeah. is and whether what we think about the prospects. But again, this is going directly to the US Ed with a copy to us, but we don't make the decisions about whether or not there's an exemption. And, um, we, and we're gonna wait to hear back like when you, when you, if a district does decide to do that, then we're asking that you CC us on, um, on that request. And then if you get approval that you CC us back on that approval, because we're out of the loop at that point, we're not, we're not the U S department of education. We hope would let us know if, if a district received an exemption, but we're not going to know because we're kind of out of that loop. That's why we're asking you to CC um, us on that. I'm just going to jump in because I'm seeing two questions about uh, folks missing the first part of this meeting. Um, th first of all, the meeting will be recorded. It takes a day or two for us to get a get that made into a YouTube video, but then we typically upload it, I would say, within two days or so. I can try to get the slides up sooner so that you can have the slides from this meeting. So yes, slides, uh, video recording, and after a day or two, we usually synthesize the questions that were asked, although we may be putting them on the frequently asked questions document instead, but somehow we'll address the questions that have been asked and make it available. And uh, someone have access to the slide we wanna give, uh, Lucy wants to know the exact uh, due date for the performance report now that it's been changed to March. Do we have that? It was one of the first Or are we looking for the reporting periods? Because I know there was one question in the chat uh, regarding the reporting periods. And just to cover that information, uh, CARES ESER 1 is now October 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. Uh, Carissa ESER 2 is July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. And ARP ESER 3 is July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. Thank you. I do understand that the expenditures we, we are reporting are through June 30th, 2021, but my understanding of the due date of the performance report was January 15th, and now I'm understanding that date's been changed. So that's what's confusing me at the moment. Right, one of the early slides. It, and this be, this was reported to us that it had been changed Hi. yesterday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> from the U.S. Department of Ed. So here it is, okay. March 25th. Great, thank you very much. And uh, I'm looking at the chat that seems to be slowing down. And Rob, I don't believe we had any other slides in this presentation after that, uh, the information just to catch up with us. Um, so seeing that uh, we can certainly stay on for a few more minutes. And if you have any other questions, whatnot, please feel free to unmute and jump right in there. Uh, if not, I hope you have a wonderful day and uh, we are available. We're pretty quick about answering uh, emails and the phone and so forth. So. Uh, we will definitely respond to anything that comes up. And as far as our web pages, uh, the web page is a lot of great information in there about all the grants. So definitely recommend you go over that direction and take a look. And I do find that those slides, I refer back to our own office, our slides for a lot of things. It's, it's good information. And uh, especially when things have kind of changed a bit at the last second. So uh, please feel free to reach out to us.